EcoSlow's Green Drinks event. Um, for those of you who don't know that much about EcoSlow, we are the Environmental Center of San Luis Obispo. We're a local nonprofit. Um, we work to educate, uh, advocate, and act for our lovely Central Coast environment here. We run a lot of different programs, from beach cleanups and tree plantings, um, to green drinks events like tonight, which we used to host in person, um, as well as like the green business program. Um, so we work with local businesses to become more sustainable as well. Um, so tonight we have three panelists. We're really excited. They're all super knowledgeable and have diverse backgrounds, um, but all um, are gonna be able to contribute to the conversation on microplastics in the ocean. Um, but before we get started with the panelists, I just want to give a brief rundown on microplastics in general. Um, so everyone has kind of a good understanding of um, what we're talking about. So to get started, what are microplastics? Sorry, I'm gonna have to be entering people into the chat still at the moment. All right, so to get started, um, you can see on the right here, this is a photo um, taken by my friend Marissa in Hawaii. Um, some plastic on the beach, a lot of tiny particles. Um, microplastics are defined as small particles of plastic that are less than five millimeters, um, but most are actually much, much smaller than that. A lot of them are actually not visible to the naked eye, but you can see on the right in this photo that um, a lot of them are still pretty substantial in size. So how do we get microplastics? Um, large pieces of plastic break down over time into microplastics, so plastic bags, um, plastic bottles. Those break down, um, especially in the ocean, um, due to mechanical degradation, like from waves, um, and then also from uh, photo oxidation from UV radiation, which makes it really brittle and causes it to break really easily as well. Um, what are some sources of microplastics? So there's a lot of different sources. Some start out as microplastics, but when they enter our waterways, so from soaps and other skincare products like the plastic exfoliant um, beads, um, also synthetic textile fibers. So from any clothing that you have that has that is made of plastic or polyester, um, a lot of those fibers actually get released into our waterways as well, um, into our wastewater, and then eventually to our oceans. Um, fishing gear, that's another big source. So especially in the open ocean, a lot of um, lost fishing gear, like plastic nets that get discarded, um, end up releasing uh, plastic fibers. So that's a big source of um, plastic as well. And then finally, tire particles. So this is one that not a lot of people think about, but every time you drive your car, um, little fibers from, or little particles from your tires get worn off onto the road. And then when it rains, all of that gets washed down into our storm drain. And as you probably are aware, your storm drain or storm drains lead to um, our creeks, which then flow into the ocean. So tire particles are actually a substantial um, source of microplastics in the ocean as well. Um, an estimated 4.8, between 4.8 and 12.7 million tons of plastic enter our waterways every year. Um, there's a lot of numbers out there, but it is a huge amount of plastic that is entering our oceans. So it's um, a pretty significant environmental issue, which is why we're trying to bring some more awareness to that today. What do they look like? Here's some more photos taken by my friend Marissa in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is located in the North Pacific Gyre. So they get a lot of plastic that accumulates on their beaches um, because essentially these circular um, ocean currents um, really help to congregate all the plastic and then it gets deposited on the beaches um, around Hawaii. So you can see here, this is actually reality um, on a lot of places in Hawaii. So they can be very small, like on her hand in the left picture, um, but they can also be some bigger, bigger pieces of plastic as well. Um, they also look like this. So this is actually a photo that I took under a microscope when I was doing some research on microplastics along the central coast. Um, we were trawling the surface waters in Avila with a really fine uh, mesh net. And a lot, like I said earlier, a lot of plastic is not visible to the naked eye, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, so these are like, this is a tiny fiber of plastic, um, which you wouldn't be able to see without a microscope, but it still poses pretty significant threats to our marine life. So why should we care? Well, quite a few reasons. So first of all, our marine life eats it. So small phytoplankton eat it, and then uh, the fish eat the plankton. 
bigger fish eat those fish. Um, and it basically bioaccumulates up the food chain. So until we eat it, um, because we eat fish that have consumed various particles of plastic. Um, so other filter feeders like oysters, they also accumulate plastic um, and then humans eat those as well. So um, it clearly bioaccumulates up the food chain until it actually ends up affecting humans, which a lot of times we don't think about if we're just thinking that it only affects marine life. Um, plastic also has toxic chemicals that adhere to it because of its hydrophobic surface. So a lot of toxic chemicals like PCBs can um, stick to the surface of plastic. Um, and then when the marine life eats that, they're not only consuming the plastic, but the um, chemicals that are on the plastic as well. I did see a really cool quote from the National Ocean Service on their website. Um, they said, it's a problem, but it's something that we can do about. So, or it's one that we can do something about. So I think that's a really good message um, because a lot of times we're posed with these um, environmental problems and it seems like there's nothing we can do, but we were the problem, so we can also be the solution. So today I'm gonna to hand it over to Jamie, our Creeks to Coast intern, and she's gonna introduce our awesome panelists that we have um, that will be diving more into this issue. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight. So I'm gonna introduce our lovely panelists for the night. So first up is Ricky Erickson. And Ricky is the director of the California Marine Protected Areas or MPAs program for the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation. She works with communities, businesses, non-governmental organizations, foundations, academic institutions, and government agencies to help implement the state's Marine Life Protection Act. Ricky holds a master's degree from Duke University and a PhD at the University of Florida where she applied landscape ecology pr pr principles to the design and management of MPAs in the coral reef eco in coral reef ecosystems. Her fieldwork has taken her throughout the, Carib the Caribbean, the wider Indo-Pacific region, and Latin America, conducting field surveys and working with local communities to examine the effectiveness of MPAs. Ricky has extensive experience at sea. She has sailed across the Mediterranean and Caribbean seas several times and has worked on commercial Alaskan fishing boats, uh, collaborated with fisherwomen in Fiji to acoustically tab, tag reef fish and helped establish the Easter Island Marine Reserve. Last year, she went on an old woman's expedition to raise awareness about the issue of marine plastic pollution and the dangers it poses to both human health and marine life. Next is Taylor Lane, who, growing up with a garage full of tools and tinkering, was his way of understanding the world around him. Raised in the live and let live ethos of Venice Beach, California, he learned to appreciate a range of diverse and alternative perspectives and people. After graduating from San Jose University in 2017 with a BS in industrial design, freelance gigs along with an internship at, the North, at North Face was an as an equipment designer, didn't feel like it was helping the world become a better place in the way he had wished. With a cigarette surfboard, he realized that he is most, most fulfilled by seeking solutions that address social and environmental problems. Having spent hundreds of hours with cigarette bugs, but he witnessed firsthand the toxic mi microplastics used in cigarette filters that are merely the tip of the iceberg. Since childhood, he's, been one, he's often been the one to ask to, fi ask to fix something. Last is Evelyn Barajas Perez, and Evelyn started career in the, her career in the environmental field at UC Riverside, where she majored in biology. She intended to go into the medical field, but later decided to pursue the environmental field when she was inspired by a conifer lab she joined. This inspired her to apply to the AmeriCorps program, the, wa program, the Watershed Stewards Program, to get her footing in an environmental career. After two years of AmeriCorps and a stint with the California Conservation Corps, she joined the Morro Bay National Estuary Program. This is where she learned about the huge negative effects of microplastics and how they affect the environment. After research, some, power, power, some office power thinking and help from Morro Bay High School freshman biology class, MBNEP started doing microplastic monitoring. Now she's a certified microplastics nerd ready to spread the knowledge she has acquired. She is also happy to say that this month she'll be joining the EcoSlows team as their sustainability coordinator. And we are very happy and lucky to have her. 
So now we're going to jump into our questions for our panelists. So first off, um, we would just like all of our panelists to tell us about yourselves. Um, what is your experience with ocean conservation and what are you currently working on? Evelyn, why don't you start us off? Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, currently, um, I'm currently working for EcoSo, just as Jamie said. I'm super excited to join the team. Today is literally day one, so <laughs> super excited. Um, and I'm a little bit about myself. Um, I originally, I'm originally from Southern California. Um, grew up in this little suburbia town. Didn't know much about the environment or how to help it. Um, that came later in college and. Um, and after that, I got my footing and I took a deep dive and here I am uh, learning more about microplastics. And um, what am I currently working on? Um, I'm currently working on um, getting situated and with my new job and hopefully be part of impactful projects in the future. Thank you so much. So next, Ricky, if you would like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience with ocean con conservation and what you're currently working on. Sure. Um, I am Ricky Erickson. Thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. And I'm originally from Denmark and grew up in Scandinavia, which has a strong sort of recycling kind of ethos to it and great programs there. I grew up on the water in the Caribbean and, and then in Florida. Um, so the ocean has been a huge part of my life um, from an early point and grew up kind of watching a lot of the systems that I were my playground, you know, being destroyed. And I've worked, as you heard from the bios, uh, a lot on marine protected areas around the world, but we've increasingly, and now in my organization, we're tackling plastics. And so when I got asked to join this all women's um, expedition as a scientist for um, monitoring plastics across the Atlantic Ocean, I jumped on that. And, and really it was like a you know five to six week crash course in the problems of plastic. So really learned a lot on that trip about everything. We had people on board that were everything from within the plastics industry and teaching us why we all depend on plastics and how, you know, it was only developed in the 1960s and now it's integral to every aspect of our lives. You would not imagine the places that plastic is actually found in products that you have no idea that it's um, in. And so, Increasingly, I still work on marine protected areas. I'm actually working on some coral reef disease stuff right now and also on sea level rise and plastics. So uh, really looking at um, the kind of source based uh, solutions to plastic. So finding alternatives to stop the flow of plastics into the environment. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and then lastly, Taylor, if you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and what is your experience with ocean conservation? Absolutely, well, uh, thanks everyone for coming here tonight. We appreciate your time. Um, you know, like kind of mentioned in my intro, I grew up building things uh, and I've always been around the ocean my entire life. I'm a Venice born and bred wacko. Um, so, you know, after graduating university at San Jose State with the industrial design degree, um, there's this opportunity for this international surfing contest to make a surfboard out of upcycled materials held by Visla and Surfrider Foundation. And so I worked to make a surfboard out of 10,000 cigarette butts picked up off the beach. And so unknowingly that kind of pitched me into the ocean conservation space. And with a good friend of mine, Ben Judkins, who's a filmmaker, we documented the whole process and, um, you know, the, the video and, and word of the creation kind of went viral. So that essentially really put us in this position where we had this opportunity to explore more as surfers and as one individual, you know, what 
can I do and what can we do being part of this larger collective and what is the responsibility that we have as surfers to kind of protect and care for the ocean. So we've gone on to focus our efforts on making a feature length documentary, uh, sort of an environmental surf film. Um, and we can you know, talk more later about what that is, but essentially uh, you know, it's, it's providing people with you know, solutions firsthand at what they can do and kind of leveraging human ingenuity to, uh, to figure out how we can protect the ocean and using surfing to talk about a narrative um, of protecting the ocean and how important it is to all of our lives from you know, California to, to Kansas City. Yeah, definitely. I think it's great that you're doing that advocacy work. Um, so the next question we have for our panelists is, how did you develop an interest in microplastics and why have you chosen to focus on spreading awareness on this particular environmental topic? So Ricky, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, you know, certainly as a marine scientist, as was aware of the plastics issue, you know, I lived in Santa Cruz and, and fairly progressive in terms of uh, plastic. So I was aware of it, but really I got launched into the, um, you know, deep end of the pool there with uh, X Expedition. Um, that's E X Expedition because it's two X chromosomes um, for all women. And I thought I knew what the problem was. You know, we all see the photos of the Pacific garbage patch and we've seen the stuff online that you see. Um, I was absolutely blown away at the magnitude of the problem. I had no idea. Um, so we sailed from the Azores to Antigua across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we're on the ocean for, you know, five weeks and it was beautiful. And then you looked out across the sea and it was blue and we had dolphins and we had whales and, um, and then we would stop and we would do sampling. So we would tow manta toes to actually do sampling. And if I had sailed across the Atlantic through, you know, we actually went north so that we could go into the gyre um, where it aggregates plastic. And I would have said, well, it, you know, it doesn't look that bad. It wasn't anything that I thought was a major problem. And then we would do the sampling and, you know, it was like you end up with a kind of a little cone like this that filters through and you look at that. And I was doing a little side study to look at the amount of plastics and you'd, you'd look at these samples and they were literally, it was like getting a gummy bear bag of all sorts of different colors of little kind of flecks. They look like little lentils and, and that kind of size of stuff. And it was just littered with microplastic. And that was only the stuff that we could see. And we were doing, you know, scientific analysis with different fluorometers and things on board to determine what kind of plastics that it was. But what I did this side calculation and was looking at the amount of live phytoplankton and zooplankton to microplastic. So any organism that's just filter feeding or eating the stuff that small little critters, and it was seven to one microplastics to live stuff. And we had this minke whale follow us for two days behind the sailboat. It was kind of freaky, but all I could think of was that guy is feeding with his mouth open for all day, every day, and he's eating seven times more microplastic than he is krill. And it just, it, it really opened my eyes. So yeah, that, that did it for me, so. Yeah, I didn't know that fact that it was seven to one. That's just well, that was amazing. my little study on my right. little expedition. Um, but yeah, I think there'll be more and more, you know, of those kinds of studies. And certainly things like krill are uptaking plastic as well. That's what's insidious about this problem is that everything is ultimately ingesting it. And it's we're only right now seeing plastic from 30 years ago as microplastic. So the curve on plastic into the ocean is like this. 
And we haven't even hit that curve yet, you know, so it's frightening. Yes, definitely. So next, um, Taylor, although one of your main focuses has been spreading awareness on cigarette butt pollution, to what extent has the topic of microplastic pollution become integrated in your cigarette surfboard project? Well, I think kind of like what Ricky said is it's it's really mind blowing at that sort of micro level to to think about how many things just get broken up into these little pieces. And, you know, our process to making a, a surfboard out of cigarette butts takes, you know, 60 to 100 hours and they all start from being picked up off the beach. And what we have to do is take them through a, a process where they're flattened and we get the tar and the and the you know, tobacco and the sand out of them. So I've kind of engineered this whole machine. But with all that comes all of these filters and all of these precautions that we take. You know, we're wearing respirators. We have a vacuum with a HEPA filter that has a bag on it that then has a carbon filter because the smell of the cigarette butts. And then, you know, so it's a really, you know, we get people reaching out to us like, hey, I want to build a cigarette surfboard. And it's kind of like, yeah, go for it. But like, there's a huge amount of you know, precautions to take because, you know, even when just handling with them, I see these, you know, particles that are that are floating and kind of like what Anna highlighted earlier is, you know, plastics, they, they not only leach toxins, but they absorb them. And I think a lot of things that people don't know about the cigarette filter is, you know, they think, oh, that it's solved when, when the filter is biodegradable, right? Uh, it'll just degrade into the environment. However, the biggest issue is, you know, there's over 70 known carcinogens in cigarette butts and over 6,000 chemicals. So when it goes through that filter, it in fact traps those, which means when it comes in contact with water, it's then leaching those into, you know, the, 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 the water system, the water table, the, the ocean, et cetera. Um, so it's, you know, I, I think kind of with what we're trying to do in terms of our project is take this idea that you know, spreading awareness can mean understanding that the, the, the implication of your actions live beyond you. And I think that's like pretty cliche, but I think when people see the cigarette surfboards, you know, they see this accumulation of all these things. Like, wow, every single one of these cigarette butts was littered by someone, but it, each one of these was also picked up by an individual on a beach. And then when you see them, you know, in person, um, it, it kind of all comes together and reminds us how we're we're part of this this larger, you know, collective for for positive or negative, um, and you know just the fact with how toxic these these cigarette butts are. I mean, you know, it's definitely not the top polluter in terms of items that we're, you know, should be really cautious about uh, in terms of all the threats facing our ocean. But again, I think we just don't know. Uh, you know, because they are leaching a lot of chemicals. And I think, you know, they don't need to be made out of plastic. In fact, there's a lot of mounting evidence that shows filters are actually more detrimental to a smoker's health because it cools the smoke, which allows them to inhale deeper into their lungs, which gives them a certain uh, more, a broader likelihood of, of certain cancers and stuff. So the solution there is, is really, you know, old school, uh, no filter or just roll a, a paper or paper crush. So, you know, again, our film is kind of about using this narrative of, of this, of the symbolism of the cigarette flick to say, Hey, you know, we've been culturally conditioned to think that there's some away on our planet, but in fact, you know, from Ricky's research and so much other mounting evidence, it's showing that the world's connected and the ocean's telling us that because what, you know, ends up on the shores of Southern California could have, left the shores of South Africa. And, and we're seeing things like that. Like in Hawaii, there's all sorts of plastics. So the ocean's absolutely telling us things. And uh, I think our film is really an opportunity to give people a chance to be like, okay, here's what we can do. And in that, we explore those topics of what people can do to start to get involved. Yeah, I think that's really important, just understanding the fact that there is no real away and that it's going to end up somewhere. Absolutely. Um, so it's really awesome that you're having your film kind of be about that and advocating towards that. Right. 
So lastly, Evelyn, um, how did you develop an interest in microplastics and why have you chosen to focus on spreading awareness on this particular environmental topic? Um, so my journey with microplastics began with the Morro Bay National Estuary Program. When I joined the team, um, I was given the task to make a microplastic monitoring protocol. Prior to this, I didn't know much about it, to be honest. Um, being someone who's fairly new into the environmental field, especially at that time, um, this was very much an eye opener. Everyone knows plastic is bad for the environment, but I don't think a lot of people think, oh, this very durable plastic can break down into smaller pieces and the smaller pieces don't become compost they don't become it doesn't become soil and it doesn't like start the cycle it it's like a it's forever there it's no it doesn't have a cycle like a tomato or a banana does that it breaks down um and so getting my um feet in the water and like really learning about microplastics i started doing the protocol and um, i ran into a citizen science uh, protocol that is made in, was made in the UK by a um, Christian environmental group and they did um, a lot of sand staining and so they would find microplastics in the sand and then they had this whole protocol it was beautifully done I took that and because they're in the UK they're not in Morro Bay I had to manipulate it and it so it would be um, better, it would be better suited for the area and the smaller space that Morro Bay has. Um, and so between uh, Rachel and I, my old boss at NEP, we um, got the freshman biology class um, in Morro Bay High to get involved. And um, it was such a cool experience to be able to um, teach about microplastics, but these kids, because they're in Morro Bay, I feel like they knew more than I did at some points. I still uh, blew their minds sometimes with certain microplastic facts, but um, it was really cool to teach them how to do this and how detail-oriented the research is, um, because I think a lot of times when you're younger, you're like, what do scientists do? Like, what they do is very specific, very detail-oriented, and so um, that, just led to, we did that about three times. We were gonna do a fourth time, but because we do it every season, we would do it every season. So um, winter, fall, summer, spring, but COVID came in, so we couldn't finish the year. Um, but we saw some microplastics, mostly styrofoam, um, and it was mostly during the summer. So we saw there was a lot um, coming from tourists, and um, incoming visitors usually, because more people are at the beach when it's hot outside, right? Um, but um, why, and this leads into like, why do I want to create awareness? Well, um, it goes back to the fact, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I did two terms of AmeriCorps in an environmental AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps program. And I had an idea of like, Bits, bits of plastic, but no one said, hey, this is a microplastic. So um, that I'm very for awareness of it, because I think first step of anything is becoming aware of it, because you can't go anywhere beyond that. That is like the door that needs to open for you to go through and see what else, what other doors you can go through. So yeah. Cool. Yeah, I completely agree just with education and advocacy, especially for the younger generations. I mean, just teaching them that if you're going to be a scientist, you have to do like very specific like research things and just kind of showing them that there's so many different things that you can do. So, so our third question is, what do you think is a common misconception about microplastics or marine plastic pollution in general? What is something you think everyone should know about microplastics? Taylor, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm definitely not the expert on this part of the panel, but you know, I think a lot of people don't even really know they exist to begin with. I mean, in the intro, Anna kind of took us through how it's coming off, you know, tires of our cars. It's in the, you know, so pretty much anything that's synthetic fiber is, is essentially like a, a microplastic so your fleece any like 
paracord rope, things like that. Um, you can actually kind of see it on a small level and then you can imagine it just gets smaller from there. Um, but I think also what people don't realize is that, um, you know, plastics attract chemicals because they're designed and manufactured to either be resistant to the sun or, you know, prevent this chemical from leaching through another chemical. So that involves a chemical. Um, so I think, you know, the, the biggest misconception about microplastics, I, I think, is coming to the, the honest fact that we don't know enough about it. Um, you know, there's a lot of question being raised around, like, is recycled clothing the, the right way to go in terms of buying recycled clothing products? Is that not just going to leach more uh, plastics into our in our waste stream and, and things like that, and what is it doing to our bodies? So, you know, um, I I think something that's kind of part of this is actually derelict fishing nets, which have two problems with them. One is they actually are you know really affecting marine life because they get caught in it because of how big they are. They also become little ecosystems inside the ocean which kind of seems cool at first, but then you look deeper and you realize that these fishing nets, again, involve a lot of microplastics. So I think like if I were to kind of narrow it down into one thing that I would be kind of concerned about would would maybe be that that area um, because it affects the, the top tier, you know, marine life. Um, but I think Ricky could probably speak more to that when, it, when she, she comes around. So. <laughs> Yeah, is that you? <laughs> I think it's actually Evelyn's turn, but okay. okay. Um, I'll dive right in then. <laughs> um, so a common misconception that I think a lot of people don't um, realize is that most marine plastic pollution um, doesn't come from coastal towns and doesn't come from direct dumping. Like a lot of people are like, a ship must have dumped all this um, recycling material when it was taking recyclables from California to China, but that's only 20%. Most of it is inland. That's 80% of it. And um, it goes with like a line, just because you can't see the ocean doesn't mean you don't have an effect on it. So you can be a town eight hours from the ocean, but that piece of trash that um, accidentally fell out of your backpack will eventually get it to a water source. Let's say it rains the next day, it'll hit a water source. From there, a tributary goes into a creek, which goes into a river. And from there, um, it goes into the ocean, an estuary and then an ocean. And um, I think that's a common misconception that even though they, um, it's not the coastal towns, it's everyone. And, um, that's a big one. And um, something that every everyone should know goes back, you, all of you have mentioned this, but like um, microplastics are a magnet. Like that one's such a big point that um, I dare repeat it again. <laughs> it's mentioned a lot, but that one, like if um, something can come, come into mind other than knowing what a microplastic is, is that these little tiny pieces of plastic that you're just seeing floating, you're like, it's just a piece of plastic. It does so much damage. It collects so many toxins. And there's so little research done right now. Like a lot of the research papers that I've read, they're all the beginning. They're all like, we're going to do this, or we're going to do that, or this is the beginning of what we've seen. And so there's so limited research on what the effects are. And that's the mystery of microplastic. How much does it affect us and the marine life? I'll give it to Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going to disagree with both of you a little bit. Okay, um, love it. But yeah, it wouldn't be fun if it weren't a disagreeing panel. Yes, of course. Um, well, I, to me, the number one in all of this is new information that I acquired as well. So I had the same thoughts as everyone probably does on, you know, this forum. The top three producers or, or um, polluters in the ocean of plastic is construction material, 
transportation material and packaging. And so while all of us have our single use, you know, our, our, you know, um, cool, what do I have here? The Corsicles, you know, and we all have our water bottles and we're not using plastic straws. I think a huge misconception is that we're going to single use our way out of this crisis. The problem is not small, you know, hotel shampoo bottles. They're horrible and there are solutions for them. And, you know, the litter that gets away from kids' lunch boxes and backpacks are, are part of it. But I think that we need to realize what the top major problems are. And if you go to a construction site, everything is in plastic. The siding now is TVAC. You know, you look at the transportation, look at the interior of your car. And if you're going to buy a Kia, a $30,000 car, and you look in it, and that Kia is, it's basically plastic. Almost the entire production of that thing is plastic. And if you were going to pay for a non-plastic Kia, you'd have to charge another ten to $20,000. And who, including me, is going to buy that Kia for $50,000? to be eco-friendly. And I think until we solve that, um, so that's the big, one big misconception. And a lot of this stuff, like um, what Evelyn said, it is land-based sources of pollution and it's all of us. The second thing that I see as a huge misconception is that it is a developing nation problem. That China, Malaysia, and all of my talks, people say, well, it's those countries that are dumping rivers worth of plastic. And I call on that because who is the number one demander of plastic? The United States. So we're shipping stuff to China where they're producing stuff for us and they're shipping it back and they're shipping it and distributing it across the world. The demander or consumer end, which is driving the economics and production of it, comes from the developed world. So, you, you, you know, we're on both sides of the problem. We're creating it, we're consuming it, and we're contributing to pollution. And the third thing that I'd say that is a huge um, misconception is that the United States and other developed countries by overwhelmingly have the ability to reduce, reuse, and actually it should be refuse. So don't buy it in the first place. If you're standing in a store and you're looking at peanut butter, buy the glass jar peanut butter instead of the plastic. Now, there's every sort of trade-off and we can debate that to all, you know, for because when you're using glass, it's heavier and it might be being transported longer distances instead of from a local source. So every place our consumption sort of drives issues, whether it's, you know, fossil fuel use or energy use or water pollution, um, but looking for, you know, alternatives. But I'm in a developed country right now. There is nowhere for it to go. So developed countries are literally drowning in plastic and it's getting imported into places and they have absolutely no means of getting rid of it. And a lot of them, like we were in Antigua when we landed there from the expedition and Antigua said that it had banned plastic bags and it was going full recycling. And we went to the dump and we talked to the, so that was by the tourist minister. And then we went to the dump and we talked to them. They have nowhere for it to go and they were shipping it to China. So yeah, China is a major problem of it, but they're also accepting other people's, including our trash. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions that we need to, you know, like Jeremy said, is really, um, you know, realize our consumption and our buying power and purchasing is driving the production and, and pollution of this stuff. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for your input on that. Um, so our next question is, what do you think is the biggest threat that mac microplastics pose for our environment? And Evelyn, do you wanna start us off? Yeah. 
Um, I believe the biggest threat these microplastics pose is the fact they, again, can keep breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces, and they're hidden in plain sight. The, um, and that goes with, ties into, or contributes to the monster more so is, we don't know much about, again, what, what does it do? What, how does it affect us? As a reference point um, of it being hidden in plain sight, humans, we eat about five grams of plastic each week, which is the same as eating one credit card of plastic. Ooh. Yeah, that's your, your diet totally off now. You're eating, you need to add those calories clearly. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that's just us, we're small. Ricky mentioned, um, I think you mentioned some whales, and they eat way more. Can you imagine how much they consume? If we, as humans, eat five grams, um, it's, it blows my mind. And so um, it's just, again, going back to the research, I found some research saying they found microplastics and honey, sugar, salt, um, and beer. They found it in all those things. And people are like, wait, what? This is supposed to be natural. And it's like, no, it's crept into everything, literally everything. Another research paper said they found, they I forgot the type of insect, but they caught some insects, they opened them up, and they found bits of microplastics in their gut. So, and um, I can't remember the species, but from what I recall, it was a small, a small insect. So if it's gone into their guts, um, that just blows my mind. But yeah, that ends my turn. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's everywhere. Um, Ricky, what do you think is the biggest threat that microplastics pose for our environment? Um, I, I think it's going to replace the base of the food chain. You know, I think the fact that it is, you know, the, um, Evelyn was talking about how we don't know much about it. The reason we don't know much about it, it was developed in the 1960s. And, you know, the plastic that we're seeing today is plastic that was lost in the ocean 30, 40 years ago. What we don't know is now we have, you know, exponentially times, you know, I don't know what the number is, but hundreds of thousands of, you know, um, tons more have entered the ocean and so seeing the impact of that and once it has you know replaced the the bottom of the food chain with phytoplankton and krill and those things are are suffering consequences from other stressors as well you know then you don't have the driver of the ocean and so i think that you know, we are at risk of losing species. You know, there's there's great studies that show that seabird chicks are starving because they're consuming and ingesting plastic, that, you know, larval fish are ingesting plastic because they're just, you know, non-discriminately consuming. Uh, so I think that's a huge risk. I think that the impacts of those toxins, as, as Jerry was saying, um, or Taylor, why do I keep calling you Jeremy? Sorry. Um, is that um, I don't think that we know what those impacts to human beings are, whether it's neurological or hormonal. The reason that the X expedition trip is all female is because the impacts of plastic toxins, pollutants on the female reproductive and hormonal and cancer linked is much greater. And, you know, there's been all these dystopian kind of future where reproduction in humans, you know, goes down. I mean, this is a real potential, right? Because it's messing with our endocrine systems. And so it's an endocrine disruptor. And if it's getting into our freshwater supply, in our marine supply, in the base of the food chain, that's a problem. And and we don't know what the pro we don't even know how to detect the problem, quite frankly. Yeah, well, I, I think you you guys have kind of heard it first from these these two experts in this field, and I won't even try and uh, touch on the biggest threat there. But I think you know there's there's a couple ways we have to look at plastics. I mean, people didn't design you know plastics to 
directly threaten the environment. It was, oh, this is an interesting material. Wow, look at all these properties it does. And, you know, it's in it's in Ricky's boat. It's in our cars. It's in our airplanes. It makes things more fuel efficient. It makes, you know, all this. <laughs> however, however the, the real problem is who who's responsible for this mess, you know? And, and the thing is, is, it's a whole systemic change of chain of, of who is really, you know, um, kind of created this problem. And I think a lot of times we get pinned as the consumers, right? The term litter reflects it, that it's, that it's our responsibility that, you know, there's trash on the beach. Well, you littered it. Um, so there's, you know, I mean, we don't even need to go into the amount of corruption that that the fossil fuel industry is sitting with our politicians but i think the next thing becomes okay well how do we begin to actually do something here because you know until we really do find an alternative to plastics that can in you know be manufactured in the ways that it that it is right now and that it will allow for you know things to exist in a similar way i'm all for that but I think we have to also attack it in the sense of, of who's kind of producing this problem for everyone. And, and I think it does become the industry responsibility factor. You know, you make it, you kind of own it. Um, and a lot of times they push the externalities of these products onto us. So for instance, you know, I go to the store, I so happen to buy something in plastic. I pay the sales tax on that product that goes into the system I then use that thing, and then it, I pay for the you know local garbage that picks that up, and then you know then it goes to a landfill, and all the time this entire chain I'm paying as the consumer for this product that continually makes profits on the backs of these big petroleum companies. So I think where we go from here is really you know they, they don't want us to be involved in policy, they don't want us to to have this information about seven to one, you know, pieces of plastic to, to plankton ending up in, in, a, in a trawling study. Um, so I think it kind of becomes our responsibility within the scientific community and the public to really deliver these facts and things in a way that people can sort of understand it and then be like, well, how do we change this? Because you know, they just want things to keep going on the status quo, which is keep buying our crap and we don't really care what happens with it. And I think until they're held responsible, you know, yes, we all need to reduce our single use plastic consumption. There's no question about that. And, you know, big highlighting theme in our film is the individual contributions of small actions collectively made by millions adds up to a lot more than we can even fathom. However, at the same time, that means not only, you know, tangibly working towards reducing single use plastic, but, you know, being part of the conversation uh, and putting pressure on those things. So, I mean, I know that's, that's far from the biggest threat that microplastics pose, but I think that the other two panelists kind of covered the real problem there and uh, how we can kind of go forward, ultimately. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of discuss the supply and demand part of things and how it's going to be a huge systemic change and it's going to be really hard. And we're totally capable. I mean, you know, I heard someone in the chat just say someone's working on a plant-based, you know, plastic or something. I mean, there's people finding out how to use like fish byproducts, but with all these things you have to weigh, you know, is it is it worth growing the corn to put it into the fuel tank of your car to be less emissions when there's so many more detrimental af aspects in agriculture, you know, or do you just like, like there's, but I think human ingenuity is, is nonetheless like going to prevail in this. We just have to kind of really be cautious with this idea that there's essentially a silver bullet because there isn't one. It's a multifaceted problem. It's going to take a multi multifaceted approach. Can, can I add something to that though? Cause, um, you, you touched on something that's really critical is that the relationship between plastic and the fossil fuel industry, and I didn't know this as well. The reason plastic is ubiquitous and cheap is because of the low cost of fossil fuels. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if we were paying for the cost of disposal, if the price of fossil fuels skyrocketed so that we actually accounted for disposal and recycling of it, you would see industry change in a heartbeat. And yeah. I, I was really glad that we had industry reps on our ex expedition because they would call, you know, it on they would say it's not we are providing a resource that you're demanding. So we're the problem because we're driving demand. They wouldn't be in business if we didn't want it. So why are they the only ones who are responsible? And I, I think that, you know, as Evelyn was saying, we're all responsible. It, it's it's all sides of the equation. Sorry, and people don't even realize plastic comes from oil. I mean, I think in this echo chamber we do, but I've had friends that are like college educated that don't even know that plastic is part of like comes from oil. And that's why we're seeing all this fracking in the Midwest right now. They're not actually using that for oil. They're using that to create polymers for plastic. Yeah, and I think it's good to make that association. So our next question is, how do you think the problem of microplastics is tied to other environmental issues or social or social justice issues? Ricky, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. I'm probably not the expert here, so I won't take up much time. Um, I think that you see, you know, places, because I work a lot in the developing world, where you see the end result or final home of plastic and places like I work in the South Pacific and um, Tuvalu and Nauru. I mean, these islands are literally, they're plat. I mean, I'll send photos of it. It's they're drowning in plastic. These gorgeous lagoons are now just filled with refuse. And it's because everything that they're consuming now is is delivered in plastic and they have no way to get rid of it. Whereas they used to be, you know, dealing with all natural products or things that actually broke down. Um, so I think that, you know, the places that are poor, that are, you know, lesser affluent communities suffer the consequences of, you know, being in those places where there's burning and disposal and, and just, you know, more environmental health issues associated with um the plastic i also think that you know a lot of the plastic like it's linked to an unhealthy lifestyle right it's convenient and things that are in plastic you know contribute to you know just poor eating habits um whereas if you're eating natural you know actual fruits and vegetables but i'll stop there because i don't know much about that totally well, neither the expert here, but Ricky definitely tapped into an important point. You know, I mean, I'm here in the fortunate, privileged side of West Los Angeles, but you go a couple miles inland to South Central, it's a totally different demographic. And that means the difference between me being able to go to a farmer's market and pick fresh produce, whereas someone else is in a food desert and everything there is largely encased in plastic. And, you know, they don't have access to those things. So I think, you know, between food deserts, the fact that, you know, fossil fuel extraction often, you know, is put on the burden of, uh, you know, black and brown communities across the U.S. and around the world. Um, I think it's also the, the, the fact that, you know, littering is, there's, a, there's absolutely a lack of education because those aren't the priorities, you know, like we're like, fortunate to be able to worry about the environment. Other people don't have that, you know, and that's understandable because they're worried about putting food on their plate. So, you know, the way that environmental issues tie into social justice, to me, it's, it's hand in hand. I mean, when, you know, we've kind of had this system where we look at the environment and people in lower socioeconomic classes as lesser, right? Like we can use this resource to extract and exploit, and we're gonna use that to our advantage to hold power and control. And whether that's the environment or people, they're inextricably linked. So I think, 
you know, that whole philosophy is just like a, a pretty patriarchal, like top down thing that we've just created through generations, if not centuries. Um, but in terms of how it functions in the microplastic sphere is just really the inability for um, people to have access in, to knowledge, to resources, and to certain things. Because then what happens is when people show up on the west side here at the beach, they don't find a problem with littering because they're coming from a place that litters everywhere. So is that really wrong of them? I mean, it's hard to it's hard to point the finger, right? It's I'm sure Ricky, you've seen in in all of these like small islands, is it used to be banana leaves that all their food was put on, and right. now it's going to throw on the side of the road. Now a chip bag comes in the picture, but they don't see anything different. It's just like, whoa, that chip bag is there, and it shouldn't be there. But like, it you know the habit is always that thing. So anyway, again, not an expert in this field, but definitely spent enough time trying to trying to understand it. Yeah, yeah. And I think my turn. <laughs> yes. Um, so one thing with, um, well, actually, Taylor and Ricky both made very good points on the subject. But um, what we need to also think is long term. So let's say we become more aware of microplastics. And from there, we find we can filter it out using this magical filter someone invented <laughs> who's going to be able to afford that middle class high class so if we start trickling down who's going to be affected by microplastics the most it's going to be the poorer communities and usually it's minority groups especially in the states they get affected by these things and um, now there's a trend of like buy like try not to buy plastic well if you grew up in a family that you could barely get by you're not thinking about how do i eat how do i put less plastic in my food and stuff you're just thinking how do i get food and so a lot of times people um in terms of microplastics like think of if our uh, if areas become super polluted to the point that um, it become, becomes super toxic to even live in an area who is going to be the only people living there, um, poorer people. And so this social justice issue goes into other environmental issues because think of all the people that still live on the land. And by that, I mean, like, think of a lot of Native American tribes in the states that still try to stay close to their traditions of fishing and hunting and they're seeing less fish now probably because the fish are consuming microplastics and so they can't swim from the ocean back into the river so that they can do what their ancestors did for years and years because of these microplastics and they're also poorer communities too because they got pushed out of their land and now they're in not as nice areas because they were pushed to land that um the states deemed not um worthy of money or didn't have something to contribute. Um, and that's that's what I know from the States. I can only imagine what effect it has on other countries because I am unaware of what they do in the other countries, right? Or what people do and their customs and traditions that these microplastics can affect. So yeah, there's so many environmental issues of killing biodiversity. We already have so many species that are so delicate. They're beautiful. They add biodiversity, especially here in California. We have so much diversity, but it's so delicately balanced. And this stress, well, Ricky mentioned earlier, biodiversity, people, a lot of animals dying, going extinct. This is just going to add to it and ties back into less food or people, less natural food. Um, I keep thinking of certain fu futuristic movies, you know, when they they have like blobs of jello and it's vitamins and food that you need. And that's at one point, like that's people are like, wow, you're really thinking out there. And I'm like, no, but that is our future if we don't take care of what's natural because 
going back, back again with social ish, ish, environmental social issues and what, how is that going to affect people, the poor won't be able to sustain themselves on that. And tying back into, we don't know exactly how plastic is going to affect us and who's going to be able to afford to go to the doctor if they find a cure for whatever that plastic causes. People who have money. So it becomes a social issue. It's a huge social issue. And you can tie it to so many things. Like um, someone mentioned a comment earlier, typed it up saying like, they found microplastics in our lungs. Let's say we be advanced and we're able to extract that. Like there's a process, we can extract the microplastics in our lungs. The poorer communities won't be able to do that. So they'll be unhealthy, likely to die at a younger age. And there won't be much help because all these natural resources, all this land that will probably be cleaner and better will be for those who have money. So that ends my turn. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so important to understand how the social issues connect with the environmental issues and how everything is just one kind of like circle and one thing affects another, so. So our last question for the panelists is, what do you think are some of the most impactful ways that people can get involved in ocean conservation and how can we all make changes in our lives to help reduce the amount of plastic in the ocean? Taylor, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, so I think the the story of the ocean needs to change. Um, a lot of times we just look out at it like a nice little beautiful sunset. And you're like, cool, horizon line ocean there's waves maybe some surfers the beach is sandy looks good however there is a much deeper world obviously that exists there and you know 70 percent of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean um 99 percent of the the life on this planet exists in the ocean so i think that we don't really you know we know more about outer space and we do the ocean. Um, so I think, you know, we need to kind of shift the story to be about, you know, this is really the lifeblood of our planet. And once we kind of look at it like that, you know, the same way that kind of gold makes up currency, you know, if I told you like 70% of the gold is going to disappear if we don't do anything, people would freak out. But no one's freaking out about like 70% of our oxygen source like dying. And like, that means nothing compared to, I mean, that, that minuscule, what the hell does gold mean then? You know, so um, I think what we have to do within the sciences and within our community is, is understand how important, you know, the ocean is. And for a lot of you tuning in from San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay, like you understand that it's like integral to tourism and the fishing community there and a lot of your lifestyles and all sorts of things. So um you know i think the story of the ocean just has to be more about like this is something we don't know but we do know that there's no real price tag we can put on it and so i think we kind of have to shift to you know using our voice to now affect policy i mean obviously you know like i think everyone kind of tuning in mostly gets it like single-use plastics cut that crap out of your life if you can and what matters most is the sustained effort better to do something that you can do over a long period of time than too much at once. You know, like I understand the world we live in. It is a plastic world. You know, you're not gonna be perfect on day one. No one expects you to, but if you can keep a habit going for the rest of your life, like that's gonna amount to something. And if you can encourage other people to do so, that's great, you know? But trying to be like, you know, kudos to all the people that are like zero waste, I can never do that. But it's like by the time and effort and energy you spend on that, write your like local politician a letter about how concerned you are about all the plastic that's showing up in these to-go places in Slow County. Like if everyone on this panel took a couple minutes to write something that was concerned, like, hey, why are we putting things in plastic containers? Like it should just be in paper. Like, like can we just work on that? It's like affecting our local landfill probably. Like, you know, I mean, something crazy that I learned today was Caltrans spends freaking $41 million a year dealing with cigarette butt litter. 
41 million dollars a year dealing with cigarette butt litter is that is that like no, like what could we be doing with that money you know so again this idea that small actions add up is absolutely part of the bigger collective thing that we can work towards but i also think we need to tell a new story about how important the ocean is because again we don't know enough about it and it provides more for us than we can either fathom but we also need to leverage you know getting involved in policy and holding our politicians and you know these industries and all of these facets responsible because if they don't get an earful then they're not going to do anything and you know of course social justice and all these things that we're really concerned about there's no doubt in my mind that those aren't important but you know the arc of things is if, if we don't have a healthy ocean we essentially have a dead planet so you know certain things won't really matter at that point again gold will be meaningless so i think all of us can just find ways to get involved and um, encourage other people to do so and that's that's the most we can do you know be part of that i mean every day is another day but i think if you're working towards something that's more fulfilling and trying to leave something better than you found it i think that just that just feels better and i think life is just a feeling right <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree that just finding a sustainable lifestyle and just educating others on what you know is really important. So, totally. So, Evelyn, do you want to talk about what you think are some of the most impactful ways that people can get involved? Um, Taylor kind of stole the show, but I'll add some points to it. <laughs> um, going back to not knowing. Um, I think a lot of people know a lot less than they think they do, oddly enough. And you don't know what you don't, oh, this is gonna be, I know double negatives and everything of, you don't know what you don't know till you know. Um, and that is such a um, big thing. Cause again, I'm going back to myself as a reference because I didn't know anything. I'm a couple years into the environmental field but I'm still feel pretty new and educating yourself on the ocean on the conservation on the work you can do alone makes a huge impact because if you don't know all these things are happening how are you supposed to want how are you supposed to have this want to do better and make changes in your life it's going to be non-existent and a lot of people sadly don't get that edu education at school and depend a lot on parents and a lot of the parents don't know either because of their background and so it's really spreading the word. And so when people was like, how do I get involved? Read a little bit on it, read an article, get involved in that way. After reading the articles, tell me a little bit more. And from there, you can go, you can go really far with just a little bit of education. And in terms of uh, what changes we can make in our lives, again, Taylor still show with that one too, but reducing your single use plastic, even though Ricky did say earlier, like, a lot of the plastic is coming from companies and so you yourself, you can only control what you do, right? You can't really control what the world does. And, but what you can do is keep, again, with Taylor, um, accountable for, like, get companies accountable for what they do. If people do the research on why our society reacts to plastic the way it does and why plastic was invented, it blows your mind. Like, plastic was invented because of electricity. They were trying to make a beetle that formed a certain substance out of it, excrete a certain substance, and try to wrap around copper cords so that they can have electricity. And then someone invented plastic, and it started, that's how electricity started. And then from there, just um, avalanche, and this little snowball just kept going. And pretty soon, companies were like, oh, there's money in this, single-use plastic we can bottle, bottle the stuff that you like the juice the soda you like and we don't have to use glass anymore because plastic is just a little bit cheaper and um a while ago i read this paper that said they had a conference in the 60s on like talking about the future of plastic and they um, a speaker, i wish i remembered his name said uh folks our future is in the trash mm -hmm. meaning that 
we will get money if people start throwing more things in the trash. And so, again, going with knowledge and going by the fact like um, history, a lot of people started kind of going against this disposable plastic usage, but then companies changed the narrative and told us we were responsible for all of the trash, but the trash wouldn't be there unless they made it. If it wasn't accessible, people wouldn't grab it. And so that's a little bit of the history of how plastics came and now they're microplastics. Um, and I will end with um, a little metaphor that again, touches base on what Taylor said, but imagine, um, so bathtub, have that image in your head. You have a faucet, you have two buckets. The faucet is on and the water is going up and you're trying to keep the tub from flooding. So you take two buckets and you start emptying out the tub of water. Now you're wondering, why didn't you just shut off the faucet? Well, the faucet is the plastic being produced and the buckets are reusing plastics and recycling. Those two only become effective once the faucet is closed. That's a great metaphor. And lastly, Ricky, do you wanna have your input on what are some of sure. the I'll add briefly. Yeah, I think that um, one of the biggest ways that people can contribute is your voice. And I think that even, you know, and I'm always, we do education and outreach in our organization. And I always think that, you know, the honey approach is a lot better. I think that if you just ask where, wherever you are, whether it's a restaurant or a clothing store, if you ask, are there plastic alternatives? Do you have any non-plastic options? I think that is much more powerful than you might give it credit for. And just letting your purchase locations know that you are aware of and interested in your footprint on the planet. I think that's one. Certainly, what we talked about disposable plastics. I think stop buying water. Nobody on this call should ever be buying bottled water. I mean, I live in Fiji and the water in the, the, the amount of water that is being shipped out of Fiji to flown all over the place, it does not taste any better um, than, yeah. So boycotting microbeads, that's gonna be something that's coming online. Um, using your, you know, whenever you see some piece of legislation that is, you know, whether it's a plastic ban or straw ban or things like that, I think signing on, cooking more. So everything that if you cook, you are actually likely to be using fresh products. Um, you're teaching your kids that. So don't eat out because there's all sorts of sources and you can't eat out right now anyway. Um, purchasing secondhand items, getting more use and life out of, you know, products. I think that has become, you know, an eco threads and things like that. I was sponsored by West Marine in Patagonia for the X expedition and they had a hard time outfitting me because we weren't allowed to have polyester in our outerwear because we would contaminate the samples. There aren't alternatives to plastic in fleece and things like that. And I was failing, you know, it was very cold where we started. Um, and it's astounding. And so I think that, you know, clothing is this huge source. And so, again, there's lots of new companies that are taking off with bamboo threads, with mm -hmm. all sorts of alternatives. Um, you know, the recycling is a no brainer. Um, and I think that one thing that we haven't touched on this is that, you know, the refuse, reduce, recycle, but the only way that we're going to solve this is what's called a circular economy. And a circular, you know, recycled economy means that I buy a car and let's say it's all plastic, but that car <laughs> then turns into the next generation of that car. There's no loss of plastic from the system. Right. And that's where you're going to see us, you know, innovate our way out of this. 
I don't think, even though El Villain suggested it, after my sail across the Atlantic, I see no chance we're ever going to recover the plastic that's in the ocean. It's, I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, it's all over the ocean. And so we better just stop inputting now. And we still have a problem in the ocean. Yeah. Well, I think we did have one question from someone that asked from Slow Coast, that, like, what's the best way to inspire an inside change into the youth when interpreting plastic pollution without getting too doom and gloomy? Well, uh, here's a capitalist perspective that actually makes sense. The economists call it the 80-20 rule, right? So, for instance, 80% of the beer that drank in society is actually only bought by 20% of the population. Same goes for crime. 80% of the pro of the crime that exists is committed by 20% of a population, which means that if we create enough of conversation, if the world is 20% in consensus and going forth on the issues facing the ocean and the environment, and theoretically, 80% of the work can be done. And they've actually even found specifically with movements, and we can take examples from the current, um, you know, social rights issues and movements that are happening. It actually takes closer to 11% of a population to be concerned about something to push an envelope. And I think we are seeing the statistics of that. I mean, yes, millions of people around the U.S., uh, went out and, and, and protest, you know, what's our population here? 350 million, 325 million in the U.S. And, you know, probably I would assume if you did the numbers, probably comes out to about 11 percent is my assumption of people that actually protested. And you can see that it's creating wakes of change. So I think the hope is that if we can just inspire more of the youth and more people to be like, look, you know, the environment is about like what ricky said a circular economy a circular system we need to just learn from nature we're all byproducts of nature let's listen to nature there is no waste in nature everything is reused everything is repurposed everything you know exists into something else then i think um that's the story worth telling so yeah 84. I, I, I agree with that and another thing i'd s s say to that uh, question is that kids, you know, look at what they did with TikTok um, and, you know, the event. I really think that kids should write, tweet, social media. They can do amazing things online with their power and they're the, going to be the ones that are dealing with this problem. They're going to be part of the innovation that's going to find solutions to this. But, you know, while we're talking about making a difference through our own little habits, you know, clearly the corporations obviously have a much bigger footprint. And if they, you know, demand change or at, even make people aware of through their social media and TikTok and things like that, I mean, they can make, what was that splash thing? That you did? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, the, the, junk, right? yeah that's, there yeah. can be all sorts of things like that that kids could do that really make a difference. So, yeah. I think to that point, too, it's also the thing is kids don't always recognize that their voice is more impactful than ours. You know, like here I'm some bearded guy. You know, I can't like it's it's like, yeah, I made a cigarette, but a cigarette butts. But like beyond that, like the, I can't really pull the heartstrings of some of these local politicians and bringing kids in and, and bringing kids in not to use them as ploys, but to let them understand that their voice, though they may not be able to vote, is in fact going to carry more votes than, than they would ever imagine. So I think it's kind of like reinforcing them in that way. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being our panelists tonight. These have been some really good discussions. Um, we do have one more question that just got asked. Um, while sustainable alternatives are great, they are often only accessible to the wealthy. How can we demand affordable products um, that leaves plastic behind? As a college student, it's also often hard to uh, justify the glass of peanut butter sometimes. <laughs> um, 
Uh, well, I think this goes with the idea of do what you can in that moment. And um, if there's a higher demand for just these glass versus these plastic containers, I feel like that's gonna have a huge impact because the glass container, that glass peanut butter, the glass for those manufacturers, it doesn't cost much, but because it's in glass, they hike up the price. And so if you go into knowing a little bit more of the manufacturing there, you can, if there's more um, call for that, then more is made, which makes it, um, if it's more, it's, if it's more likely produced there's because there's more want for it, then the price is going to go down slightly. Right. And that is a long-term idea there, but like now what you can do now, like I know, um, a lot of people that go into try to be more sustainable, they're like, I can't buy all these nice things that make you sustainable. Well, uh, you can go to a thrift store. A lot of yeah. times you can get not as not as pretty, not as Instagrammable um, products to replace your plastic ones. But if you're trying to just be a better environmentalist, just do that. You can go to your local thrift store. You can get cheap mason jars. You can get like mismatching like um, bags and stuff that you can use. You don't need those very nice looking stuff that you see like on Instagram consistently. Um, and I think that is one step towards that. I think too, Will is saying like, you have to look at everything on the, in the bigger picture, right? Um, like, you know, you got to do what you can. Like I said earlier, like to sustain efforts is more important than to like try and win every battle. And I'm not sure, certain, but I'll bet that, you know, reducing the amount of meat you eat is going to have a way greater impact on the environment than a single peanut butter jar in plastic that maybe you reuse, you know, or like supporting organic farmers at a farmer's market. So Take, you know, take it with a grain of salt and make your own shaker. But again, the sustained efforts are what's going to be be the ultimate outcome. Yeah, and I think those were some really good calls to action for everyone. Um, like you vote with your dollar. So as consumers, a lot of times if you're, um, you know, not going to refuse something, you're, you do vote with your dollar. So be conscious about what you're purchasing. Um, like Taylor and you all kind of touched on, like you're not going to be perfect, but it's about making that effort. Um, and then obviously, you know, systemic change starts at the top down too. So write your local politician, look up your local city council member, um, your board of supervisors, contact them. Um, there's a couple links to petitions that we just put in the chat box as well um, about reducing plastic waste and getting some initiatives on the um, state ballot. So, um, you know, use your vote um, with both your dollar and your voice and you can have a pretty big impact. Um, I think we don't have too much more time for questions. We've been taking up a lot of time from everyone. So thank you for hanging on with us for like an hour and a half. Um, but yeah, I think that's all for tonight. Um, no more questions in the chat. So we'll let everyone go, but there are some good links. So I'll keep this open for a bit. You guys want to check that out, but just wanted to say huge thank you to our panelists. Um, you guys are all awesome. This was so insightful. I'm sure people learned a ton. I know I did. So Thank you all so much. This has been great. And we did record this, so the link will be um, posted on our website and we'll send it out. But thank you, everyone. This was awesome. Thank you, EcoSlow. Thank you, Anna and Evelyn and Taylor. Yes, of course. Thank you, too. It was awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay.